welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, how to speak animal, deciphering vocalizations and communications, presented by NatHab expedition leader, Conan Dumanil. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Conan. Hello, everyone. Hey, thanks, Rob, and uh, welcome to all our viewers today, or uh, in this case, I should say to our listeners, uh, as today we're going to be talking about and listening to various sounds. Um, well, this series, uh, Bush Science with Conan, is something that I've, I've kicked off now, and um, what I intend to do with this is take you beyond that safari or wildlife watching experience and uh, delve a little bit into the ecology and science behind uh, what we see happening in the field. And as a start today, I'm going to be talking to you about animal uh, communications. Now, before we get into the topic, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been guiding trips for close to 20 years now around the subcontinent um, of India, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. And I'm um, really grateful to have had some spectacular, uh, been to some spectacular places, had some fantastic encounters with wildlife, uh, and seen some truly remarkable natural history moments. Uh, however, one of the most significant uh, sort of passages of time or significant experiences um, I've had has not been on, on a, a safari where we've had some awesome, uh, you know, tiger, leopard sightings or you know, big mammal action or uh, for that matter, in a remote corner, looking at some really uh, spectacular birds. Uh, but instead, it, it comes from a time where I spent time in the jungle uh, with a microphone. Now, uh, to tell you a little bit about that, uh, it was the year 2006, uh, pretty much to the day, I would say, uh, sometime about the same time uh, of the year. I was recruited uh, by a firm to uh, to take audio recordings of various animals and go around the jungles of India. And I spent about 45 days uh, in, in the jungle with a microphone and, and recording equipment. Uh, now, this was before the time of cameras, uh, so I don't have a picture of myself, so I'm using a stock image to sort of represent that. Um, but yes, but that, that particular period of time, um, you know, sort of counterintuitively uh, opened up my eyes to a whole new world. And it was only then, it was then when I found myself not looking through a camera lens or through the binoculars that I really noticed how rich this experience can be and how much you learn by keeping your ears open and letting that sort of work on your mind a little bit. So today I just wanted to share with you, um, you know, some of my experiences and also some of my learnings that I've had from the natural world into this in this world of, of sound and what you can do by you know just keeping uh, your ears open or paying a little more attention to your ears um, and, and not just through your eyes. You know, humans, we are very visually oriented species. Uh, our whole you know adventure is actually built around what we can see and experience and have that experience through our eyes. But there are various senses in which we can engage uh, with the natural world and hearing or sound is definitely one of them. So I just want to open up uh, a little bit into this fascinating world of animal sounds and how they communicate with each other. Now, before we start, uh, I just want to lay uh, some facts or some, some points here for, for a little bit of perspective and a little bit of context. Now, in animal communications, uh, we've seen, uh, studies rather have shown, that uh, natural selection seems to favor uh, callers who produce these sounds and uh, affect the behavior of listeners and uh, and also to listeners who acquire this information uh, from sound. So there is a there is a transfer of information that goes across, and uh, we've seen animals that can actually produce or listen to sound um, is actually favored uh, into the larger scheme of things. Now animal sounds have a lot of parallels uh, with human sound or with human language. Uh, probably the biggest distinguisher in animal communication from human language is perhaps, and again, I say this uh, with some trepidation, and perhaps, uh, and to a certain extent, uh, the inability to recognize the mental state of others. 
Uh, now, there are exceptions to this, of course. And then the third thing I just want to lay out there is, you know, animal sounds, much like ours, again, can either be referential or emotional. And again, a big difference between here and uh, with, with animals and with, well, non-human animals and us humans, uh, humans, we are quite limited in how we communicate. Uh, we see, but we see a variety of communication mechanisms, and herein lies the key uh, to what we're going to talk about a lot today. Uh, we see a variety of communications in the animal world, and today we will uh, focus on the auditory sense alone. And when we talk about animal communications, we are talking about not just sound, but also chemicals, visual um, patterns, color, and so on and so forth. But for today's presentation, uh, we will focus uh, specifically on sound. And we look at how animals use acoustics uh, to communicate, not just with their species, but also between species as well. So let's talk about animal acoustics, right? How are they made? What do they mean? What purpose do they serve? And when we talk about auditory communication, uh, and it is a form of communication, um, I've basically broken it up into four main categories for the sake of this. And, and uh, what I would like to do is go into each of these areas and reference them, talk about how they produce some interesting facts and tidbits behind them, and also relate to the sounds because we are, uh, in most cases, are familiar with these sounds. We may not be familiar with some of these species, but we, are, we all know sound. And uh, whether it's we've heard animal sounds in the wild or we've had uh, a pet at home, we're able to reference that sound to a message. We also know uh, that some species are more vocal than others. Some are a bit more chattier than others. But have you ever thought, and just, just pause that thought here for a second, have you ever thought about the mechanism that goes behind uh, the sound? Right now, when we talk about vocalization is the first sort of thing that we are going into uh, it is sound produced something that we are most familiar with it is sound produced via the mouth or the larynx that is our vocal uh, box or our vocal cords and our respiratory system so all of these three things combine and form a mechanical or, or, or is a mechanical function that produces these sounds words are sounds that have meaning in in human uh, sort of context and for the animals too, uh, it has a lot of meaning. But behind this mechanical function, there is also a large neural function that happens. Um, muscles in the larynx um, take up some of the vast, take up vast amounts of energy it requires to produce the sound. And if you don't believe that, uh, anyone who's a talker or anyone who's given a long speech knows by the end of it, they're actually quite exhausted. So it does use a lot of energy uh, and similar to our muscles when we work out in the gym or go out for a hike you know there is a buildup of lactic acid that happens but in vocalization uh, there are other things that happen and if you look at it from a neurological perspective all these activities that produce sound require very very fast firing uh, neurons to control the vo vocalization and these neurons can sort of generate or no sort of these neurons generate a toxic byproduct that needs to be carried away like much like how our muscles with the lactic acid i was talking about um, but studies have shown that vocal animals including us humans uh, share protein molecules that protect these fast firing neurons from deterioration or from a toxin overload uh, so there's this wonderful sort of science that happens this beautiful phenomenon that happens where Neurons are being formed. Neurons form this pathway. Uh, the, they fire, they produce these uh, electro uh, signals that carry and that actually tells our muscles what needs to be done. You know, the control of our voice, the control of a particular sound, the variety in the sounds that we make, all of them are produced, uh, controlled uh, by the brain and this, this really, really complex uh, neural uh, network that controls all of this. So, Hence, we're able to communicate a lot. And it's not just us humans, and I say us, I mean animals as well. And, and there are some chatty animals out there. And if you're wondering, again, which is the chattiest animal? Now, I am not sure if 
any study has been done uh, as to see uh, what the chattiest animal is. But I think uh, we can say without a shadow of doubt that dolphins are some of the most chattiest of them out there. Um, they will be probably number one contenders for that title. Now, dolphins, much like us, have a very, very uh, complex set of vocalizations. And enough study has been done on them to show uh, that it is so complex uh, and it is so varied that it can actually constitute a language uh, by itself. Now, bottlenose dolphins in this case uh, have even involved specific sounds for individuals. And I'll, let, I'll pause for a moment there uh, to let that sink in. When we say a special sound for an individual, if you connect that into the human context, that amounts to a name for a person. So much like us, we have specific sounds, which is a name attributed to a particular person. Dolphins have evolved that, and it's it's mind blowing just to be able to to think of that. Um, and you know, all of these vocalizations, apart from just name calling or identifying or, or communicating with individuals, they serve a, a variety of of purposes. Um, and before we start uh, getting into those. Let's hear some dolphin sounds. All right, so. I'm going to be playing a lot of these sound clips here. I mean, we can't, you can't do a talk about sound without actually playing some sounds. And I had to put the dolphin thing in there because I think they're the one of the most pleasant, sort of pleasing uh, sort of sounds you could hear uh, rivaled up there with probably the most beautiful of, of songbirds uh, anywhere up in the natural in the natural world. Um, and and we're going to be listening to a lot of clips along the way today. Uh, <clears throat> but let's look at the function of these sounds and, and what they do. Uh, I think something that probably a lot of us are very, very familiar um, with is we all know many animals, um, mammals, birds, insects, all of them produce sounds and are most vocal uh, during the mating uh, and courtship period. And no other mammal, I think, uh, symbolizes a very, very vocal mating or a courtship uh, of like lions we see here. This is a fantastic picture taken uh, of this pair of lions uh, by a good friend, uh, Richard, who guides our Africa trips. And um, though the sound recordings were not his, I, I, I pulled them off um, from certain sites. Um, if you witnessed lions mating in the wild or seen a documentary or, or heard uh, um, the audio, you know that it can be quite the clamorous affair. And, it, and it's not a five minute or a 10 minute job. Uh, meetings in big cats can go on for, for days on end, sometimes five or six days up to a week and at multiple times, uh, sometimes even up to 30 times a day uh, in case of lions. And this can be a long donor affair. And these affairs, uh, pun intended, uh, can be very, very vocal. Um, so in case you ask, all right, Conan, what is a lion uh, courtship for mating sounds like? Well, guess what? I have a clip for you. Now, they, they have a variety of calls. I've actually just snipped that down to a very, very short snippet for the purpose of this presentation. Um, but it can be very, very rock, raucous, and some, uh, sometimes deafening almost. And uh, there's also a variety of these low, sort of almost subsonic growls uh, that, that take part. And, and, if you, and if you're familiar with lion behavior, so usually it, it, uh, it, it uh, starts off with 
uh, a female uh, showing her intention, a male who comes on the heat then will approach the female. Um, there is a, a sort of a, a procedure involved. She has to accept the male. And then once accepted, then this mating pair will kind of go off uh, separately almost away from the from the pride uh, with lions and, and with solitary animals like leopards and tigers, uh, they can go into uh, all up by themselves and you won't see them for days. Um, and yeah, and then the, the mating process uh, starts. And then sometimes uh, I've heard guides who have actually followed uh, the calls uh, out on safari to find uh, to find these mating pairs. But it's not just lions that are very vocal. Uh, like I said, a lot of large cats do it. Smaller wild cats do it as well. Um, but for me personally, uh, I think the sort of the most guttural, the, or the sort of the most, I mean, the call that has had the most uh, sort of effect on me has been that of leopards. And I'm quickly going to tell you a story here. Uh, this was years ago when I just started guiding. Uh, I had come across, uh, we heard these calls in the night. We heard a leopard call in the night. And uh, my roommate and I was also a naturalist. We sort of headed out of our tent uh, into the camp to kind of gauge which direction this call was calling coming from. And then we heard it coming in one direction. So we kind of walked out of our camp a little bit with our armed with our torchlights and a very stout stick. Uh, we knew it was a leopard and we know how shy they are and we also know the behavior that they're not out there to attack. So we were very safe. And a few minutes in, we heard a call coming from the opposite side. And uh, by then, we had sort of walked out onto this open uh, sort of field that was not used anymore. And here we are, my, my friend and I, standing in the middle of this field, moonlit night. It was probably around midnight or so. Uh, beautiful call in our pajamas with our torches and our stick. Um, and then we heard this leopard call coming from one side. And then we heard a response coming from the other side. And then we heard the calls getting closer. And at that point, no, we did not decide to wait and see what happened. At that point, we turned very promptly and went back to our tent and uh, heard the rest of it from our tent. Uh, but yes, a leopard call, uh, I mean, speaking of it right now is, is, is turning my hair on end. Uh, but a leopard call is so guttural, uh, it mimics a sawing sound and can be so loud. I mean, you think an animal, you know, much smaller than a lion or tiger can actually produce the sound. And where we were, often you find leopards uh, in the valleys. And when they are at the bottom of the valley, the sound just reverberates. Uh, and to give you a little bit of that experience, uh, I'm going to show you and play you a clip as well. <laughs> So a lot of people describe this sound as a sawing sound. Uh, it, it sounds, um, I mean, it has to be experienced for yourself. It, it sounds very flat listening to it on, on speakers coming out, but it is much, much deeper than that. And both males and females will, will call each other out. Uh, it's also a form of territory um, sort of advertising as well. Uh, but we've seen them uh, call out to each other and then you know sort of come together. Uh, these series of images here are from Central India. This is again by another friend of mine um, who guides tips for, for NATAB as well. Uh, we see leopards on, on some of our trips here in India and it's, it's a fantastic uh, animal uh, to see in, in the wild. Uh, but it's not just mammals that make these sounds. We, we know birds. Birds are very vocal when it comes to courtship and some of the vocalizations are also accompanied uh, by uh, various displays as well. And I think one of the most uh, raucous, so one of the most loudest vocalizations um, that happen in, in the bird world, at least here in, in Southeast Asia, are the great hornbills. Now, these are massive birds, I must say. They're about you know three feet tall from head to tail. Uh, they have a large wingspan. Um, and they're massive birds that, that congregate in some, some regions. And the male and female actually bond, a uh, pair bond for life. And here you see this, it, this is a pair. The male is on the left, the female is on uh, the right. And when they start, so the courtship involves a lot of vocalizations, but when they pair bond, they also sort of call each other out, uh, kind of 
seen a duet or so in the morning before they start off on the foraging as well and then you'll hear these calls again in the evening so hornbill calls are quite fantastic and again because they are high canopy birds live in, in tall evergreen forests you will hear the their calls resonate uh, through the jungle and i'm just going to play a sound for you as well here yeah. So it is actually, uh, there, there is a build up, there is a crescendo that happens, you know, initially it starts off by a single call, one of them would say pong, pong, if you heard that call at the beginning, and this can go on for a while, and uh, when they come together, then it becomes more cacophonous, and it goes like, rack, 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 rack. and there's a lot of, you know, posturing that happens between the two, and usually by the end of the call, it results in them, you know, sort of taking off to uh, the area where they want to go forage. And like I said, so they're they're mainly uh, high canopy uh, dwellers. Before they uh, they make these calls, they also like mature forest because they like to feed off uh, figs and other fruit. Uh, so they really they need really tall trees and good luscious growth forest. Uh, again, fantastic birds and and even when they fly, uh, you hear their wing beats. Uh, I think it sounds like a helicopter overhead. Uh, honestly, and if if you've traveled to Southeast Asia and you've seen these hornbills, you know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. But if you thought the hornbills were loud or the lions were loud, wait till you meet this next guy who we have. Now, this this chap is from a world away. He's in sort of the northern parts of South America. And the bird we're talking about, oh, excuse the typo, I just noticed. Uh, this is not the great hornbill. This is the white bellbird. Excuse the title there. Um, these guys can be really, really loud. Now, they have specific adaptations uh, in their body to produce a sound, and their sounds have been clocked at, believe it or not, 125 decibels, which means really, really loud. And to give you some reference of scale, uh, there's a little graph down there which will give you. So a human voice right now uh, for your thing, I have marked myself. I am speaking at around 48 decibels at the moment, and this is 125. So city street averages uh, in America, city street is roughly around 90 decibels, and a jet plane is a little over 140 decibels. So this guy is really, really loud. Don't believe me? Listen. Now this again is is a quoting call, and scientists who have observed uh, these birds uh, have often wondered how the females actually respond without turning deaf, uh, because what the the white bellbird does, it sits right next to the female, or female comes and lands on the branch, and uh, then he utters this call, and he's got this weird little head toss thing, and and that head toss with the little wattle dangling in front. According to researchers, say that that kind of is the indication that he's about to let his call go. And it is noticed that the female, just for that one second, turns away where he lets the call go and then she turns back. So she doesn't get the full blast uh, in her face. And I think that's just nature's way of kind of, you know, balancing or evening, uh, evening the odds right there. Like I said, so, you know, we're looking at just a brief into vocalizations and all that. Apart from you know everything going on, uh, like I said, mechanically and and neurally, uh, some animals have specific adaptations to produce uh, these sounds, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. And with the white bellbird, and if you look at this picture here, he looks like a muscular guy. He looks like a chap that's been working out in the gym. And they actually have uh, tissue that is about five times thicker than most birds, and they have this perfectly sculpted chest, which which means the muscles are well developed. And what it does is those muscles control the breathing. They control the air pressure that comes out of the lungs and able to, to make these crazy, crazy sounds, these really, really loud sounds. And again, this is an Amazonian bird. 
it's at the top of the rainforest, high canopy, and you can imagine that sound resonating um, through the forest. So yeah, so it's it's fantastic uh, the kind of things that we see out there in, in nature. Now, Conan. and it's not. Conan, yes. can I interrupt you for a second? We had trouble hearing the bellbird. Do you think you could play that sound for us again? Uh, sure. Just a second. <laughs> Do you hear that time? I'm afraid it's not coming through. Oh, dearly me. Okay. Did was the other sounds uh, audible? Do you hear the others? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, it may be okay. Let's try it one more time, folks. All right. I hope it worked this time. Unfortunately, I don't think it did. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. I have a recording which I will try and find on my phone. So by the end of this, uh, when we have the question answer uh, time, I'll try and play it off my phone into the into the mic directly. Maybe that will work. Good point. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's probably has to do with the frequency. It's a really high frequency uh, uh, sound uh, that this makes us so probably not picking up on the speakers uh, because it's you know through multiple systems. So uh, let's we'll give it a shot at the end of the uh, the show, folks. All right. So apart from from mating and courtship, we've also seen animals use calls uh, to display uh, or to mark their territory. Uh, now many animals are territorial. Um, it's kind of a call that you know usually you will hear sometimes early in the mornings and late in the evenings, where you know they will have this resounding call going, advertising to the others, advertising to other competitors uh, of the same species that this is my territory. Uh, you know, stay off. And yes, we're all familiar with you know calls of lions, perhaps. Uh, but a very, very interesting call. And again, I, I, I come back to sort of the eastern part of India and south um, of India, where we have this uh, species of ape called the hula gibbon. Now, we have gibbons all over um, Asia, and uh, they're known for their territorial calls. And if you're traveling on the Grand India tour, or if you have, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the hula gibbon seen in Kazilanga National Park. Uh, and, and you'll often hear the calls very, very early in the morning. And uh, these are used to these calls are used to identify individuals within the family group because that's how they're structured. You also can identify calls of other families. And uh, what they use it is in, in 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 form as a form of a territorial defense, where they uh, speak to each other or they communicate with the other troops or other families in the region. And it usually starts off. Uh, with a male and female together and not only does it use to to intimidate neighbors it's also like this sort of a morning routine call and like i mentioned earlier it's like a duet between uh two animals and 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 the, the male and female will will start off uh and it can go on for hours and the other members in the group uh will pick up on this call as well so here's here's a sound for you you heard that one. Right. 
Great. So good. I hope that worked uh, because that almost woke up the neighbors. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so apart, uh, apart from this, uh, we've also seen vocalizations uh, that are used for, for social learning. Now, when I say social learning, uh, think about, you know, working uh, as humans, you know, when we, we work with, uh, with babies, we talk to them, we speak to them. And this is not a, a phenomenon that is unique to humans and is also unique to a lot of animals as well. And in a species that you would probably least expect it, and that, that is the zebra finches of Australia. Now, tiny, tiny little birds, very, very gregarious, very, very social birds. They're always in flocks. Uh, they're actually very, very popular in the pet trade because they're easy birds to keep and they're constantly chattering uh, with each other. But um, scientists have actually studied the vocalizations uh, in, in zebra finches, and they found that these vocalizations are actually fundamental uh, to the, so the social interaction between these birds. Now, with a lot of birds in their flocks, uh, they're usually one particular uh, family, and they have noticed in zebra finches that the young ones actually acquire uh, the speech and, and languages from uh, the adults as well. And in, in, uh, in, in these sort of in interactions we've seen, and not just finches, but other songbirds have shown this uh, as well. Uh, there is, you know, when, when these interactions happen, there is actually a hormone that's, that's synthesizing inside our, uh, our neurons as well and, and these birds, and that actually uh, promotes the pathways that actually help in the learning of new sounds. So it's, it's amazing that a particular physical interaction can stimulate the growth of speech as well. And it's, it's similar with, you know, when you kind of juxtapose that with, you know, our interactions we have with, you know, young kids, you know, playing with them, speaking to them, and uh, you, you know, puts things into perspective. And it is seen that in this study with the finches, um, that the vocalizations in the chicks that are hatched are not yet fully developed. And what they've seen is that the vocalizations with the adults are actually toned down a bit into a more simpler form so that the chicks can uh, meet that and then grow together. So it's like it's like baby talk, folks. It's like, you know, when you when you talk to a baby, simple words first and then more complicated words. Zebra finches, these little tiny diminutive little birds are able to do that as well uh, with their young as well. And it's and there's this crazy study. Uh, if you have the time, look it up uh, as well. It's it's just uh, it's amazing. It's not just with uh, you know just sensory motor skills that they're able to pick up and so on. And uh, the interesting part here uh, is that the male zebra finches are the ones that do most of the teaching and most of the interactions with the with the baby. So just throwing it out there, folks. You know, <laughs> it's just there. And these are finches. These babies stay, of course, with um, with the with the adults, with the males, especially for about 50 to 60 days, and during that short period of time, they're able to develop very very complex uh, system of communication, uh, and it's it's crazy. You know, individuals have their own sort of pattern, speech, and tone, uh, even which we generally thought only uh, belonged uh, to humans. So yeah, it's it's a fascinating world out there, folks. So apart from social learning, we also see vocalizations, uh, and we know with bats they use vocalizations uh, to identify and um, uh, food sources. Uh, it's it's an integral part. Their eyesight in most species of bats are not very very well developed, but what they have is a very very complex sonar system, which is you know the inspiration for how submarines navigate underwater. Uh, is from comes from bat uh, sonar as well. So they produce these high-pitched sounds. <clears throat> I'm not going to play any uh, sound clip here because you cannot record uh, the high-pitched bat sounds. But we do hear slightly audible frequencies as well. If anyone has been around bats, they know that they have a range of frequencies. But the frequencies but that they use uh, to navigate and find um, their uh, food source are high-pitched. It's outside our audible uh, range. And with the bats, especially if you're looking at the spear nose bat here, which is native to Central and North America, uh, sorry, uh, Central and South America, 
they uh, have their sonar so accurate they can actually pinpoint uh, a specific target close to about four uh, millimeters apart and and they can distinguish in terms of time uh, it's somewhere about 20 microseconds apart from each other so there's this rapid uh, emitting of sound 20 microseconds is you, you cannot fathom that with with the human brain uh, and they're able to produce this and able to map uh, their area just by these sounds uh, that they make now <clears throat> that's identification of food and on the flip side of things the prey species the food in a lot of uh, the animal kingdom also have their own little alarm system going and you know for a naturalist uh, that works uh, especially if, if you're a naturalist working in india and i say this a lot you know when we're traveling here we talk to our guests uh, we don't often navigate by sight we also navigate by sound when we are you know doing our traverses of the indian jungles and one of the sounds that you know sort of gets every naturalist up on their feet get them excited uh, is the sound of an alarm call uh, in the indian jungle and now you must ask what an alarm call is so prey species have evolved a way to signal to themselves between their species and also between uh, between other species as well interrelated species uh, they have the system where when they see the sign or smell or hear the movement of a predator they will give an alarm call out now there is a hierarchy and alarm calls as naturalists uh, 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 or guides we we use you know some alarm calls are more reliable than others the munchak for instance if you see on the bottom right of your screen uh, also known as the barking deer because they uh, emit the sound of a sounds like a dog barking uh, these can be less reliable calls and then when you have an alarm call of a monkey which is a sight uh, which calls on sight you know that they're actually looking at a predator and something is nearby and in our case it usually means a tiger or a leopard so if you're tracking tigers or leopards uh, in in the jungle you need to uh, wait for the alarm calls you need to hear the alarm calls of these animals and as naturalists and guides as you know as much as the prey species emitting these calls you can judge by the intensity uh, the volume uh, the frequency of these calls you can judge how close uh, if a predator is actually there or has moved away moving towards whether you're in danger or not so not just for the animals but as naturalists as well this is a great uh, sort of uh, frequency to tune into when you're in, in the wild. Let's hear. That's a barking deer. As you can see, it's very close to a dog bark. And the next two calls you're going to hear uh, are from the spotted deer and monkey calling in tandem to each other. The first call you will hear is a spotted deer, which is a very shrill sort of ooh, ooh, kind of call and the other sort of a chuffing call is from the langur monkey up there So that's that's the call. Uh, often you'll have you know drivers guides slamming the brakes because if they hear that, that means there's something really nearby. And that last track you heard there was taken on on safari. So yeah, there was a lot of disturbance with moving around in the jeep and clicking of cameras and so on because we were actually seeing uh, a tiger out there. Uh, but yeah, it's sometimes you know you're out there on this you know forested path and you have all of these things happening and it just opens up a whole new visual. Uh, really of what could be happening behind the spigots of what could be playing out uh, in nature even though you're not seeing it so very very exciting times uh, the another set of alarm calls so it's not just mammals but birds as well and uh, this is from our last season 
uh, when we were in, in Ramthambore on a tiger quest. Uh, this was a picture. Uh, we had this red water lapwing in the foreground, uh, which I took. We were, stand, we were parked up by a lake waiting for a tiger to come down. And uh, we had this, this juvenile crocodile walk past. And uh, well, the bird, let's say, wasn't happy at all. <laughs> That's just a short clip. Um, yeah, it's so they, they're also known as the did you do it bird because that's how their call sounds. And these are ground nesting birds. So any predator, any any danger, sometimes when you walk too close to them or drive up too close to them, they start making these alarm calls. So you have to be watchful as to not step on the nest because it's a little hollow, sort of a little cup shaped nest in, on, on the ground as well. Um, and what they would often do is they, they work in pairs. So one of them would feign a broken wing and they would kind of lead the predator away from the nest. And while the other one sort of dive bombs uh, and sort of big, a lot of uh, distraction and, you know, aggression that they show even for predators much, much larger uh, than themselves. Right. So moving on into our next section, uh, it's not just vocalizations that, that produce sound but it's also another form, more mechanical form called uh, a stridulation. Now, a lot of you may not know the term, but you would have definitely heard this sound. Now this is a sound produced by by friction, and we often hear them in insects. Crickets are the most uh, sort of the common ones. I think the most familiar of of uh, what happens. If you have uh, cicadas around where you live, you know that during cicada season, it's a beautiful sort of a wavy sound that that is made by multiple individuals. Uh, but stridulation uh, in insects basically uh, involves uh, specific appendages that they have. And if you see the inset picture uh, down there on the bottom right, they actually have um, sort of an appendage on, on the back or closer to the tail end or sometimes on the underside of a wing uh, that has, it's, it's almost like a file, uh, file shape. And uh, it is rigid. And what they do is they, they have to rub one surface against the other. So usually on the opposing surface, uh, you have teeth. And then on the other side, you have sort of a file-like structure. So grasshoppers, if you know, rub their legs together. Crickets have a, a wing uh, that they do it. Cicadas do it with a wing as well. So it's 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 the rubbing, uh, a sound that causes uh, this movement. And uh, again, these these were sounds are produced for a variety of re um, reasons. Uh, studies in crickets have shown that. Um, there can be aggressive calls that the males make to kind of ward off the other uh, males as well. Um, ag aggressive song, so to speak. Uh, females can uh, respond to particular uh, songs uh, of, of a male. And then when they get, get together, uh, the male actually after copulation, the male uh, is known to even make a sort of a triumphant uh, kind of a sound which kind of forces or encourages a female to lay her eggs where we can then, um, uh, you know, fertilize from, uh, from externally. So once she hears that particular sound, she's, she's ready to lay her eggs and then she knows there's no other male um, around. And so a lot of this, and, and that also will reinforce the sort of the, the mating bond and encourage her to, um, you know, to, to lay. Uh, so yes, so there is a variety of, of sounds there. Uh, not just from establishing territory or warning off other females. It's it's something uh, more complex and uh, more intimate, uh, should I say, uh, than just that. So and and the same is with with a lot of other uh, insects as well. Uh, from stridulations of cicadas. Uh, again, there's a picture of, of one I I saw hatch this season. Uh, he's out there. Uh, and they have beautiful lace-like wings. And it's there is a there is a uh, the appendages on the back when they, and they rub their wings together on that. So <clears throat> apart from from stridulation, we uh, there is also vibration that produces sound and where they use 
uh, animals use a specific organ uh, to make these sounds. And uh, you might be familiar with, uh, with some animals, you know, low growls in elephants actually emit from their stomach and their trunk, not so much from the vocal cords. But uh, you would never expect the animal that's coming next that produces quite, quite the interesting sound, I must say. And that is uh, the toadfish. He's not the uh, he's not the prettiest bloke on the uh, on the block, um, but they are such fascinating animals. You now, toadfish are found actually all along your eastern coast in the United States. They're bottom dwellers. They love feeding amongst rocks. They eat worms, crustaceans, mollusks, and other fish as well. And uh, what they also do is they they dig dens and they have this elaborate sort of courtship uh, that the males again produce. Uh, sound for courtship and you know they're fish they're devoid of vocal cords and you know why should mammals and birds have all the fun you know you've got fish that actually produces uh, a variety of sounds and wait till you hear this We are not hearing anything, Conan. I think there is an issue because I'm not hearing any as well. Um, all right. I think, uh, I apologize, folks. I think there are certain sounds, I think, outside of the frequency the computer seems to like. Um, and because this is, again, a very, very low frequency sound, and I don't see it coming through. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, it seemed to have worked outside of the presentation. Uh, I don't know why it's doing it on this. Um, but anyways, if, if I can describe it to you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very low, it's almost like a foghorn uh, kind of sound. And how they produce this sound is, you know, the, so fish have swim bladders and, um, and the, the swim bladders control their, uh, their buoyancy. And they have muscles, the, the toadfish have muscles that are attached from the swim bladder. And what these muscles actually do is that they, they vibrate uh, and they, uh, sorry, they contract and expand. And in such rapid frequency that it actually vibrates the swim bladder. And all the fish needs to do is then open its mouth and then that, that pressure is exerted uh, and you can actually hear an audible sound. Uh, if you go onto YouTube, just Google up toadfish. Uh, this is the oyster toadfish. There are several species of, of toadfish. Just Google toadfish sounds and you'll be absolutely fascinated uh, by the variety of sounds different species uh, can produce. Divers have recorded this sound uh, while diving. Some, some of them don't even know what it was initially, but uh, there's, there's plenty of videos out there. Uh, on YouTube, please, please go ahead and have you have to have to listen to the sound. It's it's the most mind-boggling thing ever. You think of fish producing an almost vocal-like uh, sound. Um, from vibration, we also uh, so our next uh, candidate here though doesn't produce a sound, but you know let's talk about the swim bladders a bit. Now this uh, now this is a orange chromide. It's a kind of cichlid uh, fish that lives in shallow streams. Now, what these fish have actually do, even though they're not able to produce sound, they have actually developed appendages. And this again is not a hearing appendage, but an extension of the swim bladder, which is able to pick up vibrations in the water. Now, if you think about, you know, fast flowing stream, you know, can be very, very noisy. And what this actually works is a, a defense uh, mechanism for them. Um, and, and that's what the study right now we know uh, we don't know whether it has other functions as well, but they actually have these receptors on the swim bladder. And if you look at, at the inside picture, the swim bladder actually has two prongs, uh, which is a left side and a right side, much like our ears or anything that we need, you know, that's sort of the, you know, binocular kind of hearing, so to speak, or the dual hearing, which gives us uh, direction. So they are actually able to detect sound in water through their swim bladders. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah, moving on uh, into other ways in which animals produce sound, uh, percussion sounds, uh, which is you know striking two body parts together, uh, and something that you know those of you in the United States are very 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 well uh, familiar with are these. Now the rattlesnake is actually well the rattle is actually a, a percussion instrument. It comes from the Greek word well the genus for the rattlesnake the Crotalus genus comes uh, from uh, the Greek word crotalos, which basically means a cassonet. So if any one of you have been in a band or played um, in high school, you know what a cassonet is. It's a percussion instrument. It, uh, it's a, a rattle, basically. And so this is actually produced by uh, a specific set of scales uh, that are in the tail. And you know rattlesnakes use this as a warning uh, to ward off predators or if you're too close to them. Um, and this sound is amplified because all of the segments in the scales you see there uh, are hollow in that particular shaker. And the muscles that that control the the rattle are some of the fastest firing uh, muscles in the natural world and can fire at about 50 times per second on average. And not only that, it can sustain itself for about three hours. Studies have shown that rattlesnakes can actually go on for three hours, and that takes a lot of energy uh, and that's really a snake that doesn't want to do any harm it's letting you know like hey back off you know that's my rattle beware of the rattle you know stay away <laughs> uh, other Sorry. <laughs> other animals so other percussionists in this group uh, include uh, the shoe bill now this is a fantastic bird. I mean, it's such a weird looking bird. It's from Africa. It's uh, it's a type of stalk uh, or a shoe called a, a shoe bill stalk. Um, and uh, it's not only a weird looking bird, it also has uh, probably one of the weirdest sounds in the animal kingdom. That was a sound recorded in a zoo, and uh, yes, that that is actually clacking of the bill uh, that makes a sound. And if that machine gun type fire wasn't loud enough, it's also got this really hideous sort of howl that it lets lets out. So the vocalization and percussion it can be a band in the band all by itself. Uh, and and again, that that sound is is crazy. Uh, again, it, it is a courtship sound. Um, I mean, one would only think. Uh, who would find that sound uh, in, inviting? Uh, but yeah, it it's also can be used as a warning as well and a territorial uh, call as well. Uh, also, uh, mammals use percussion as well, and probably none better than uh, gorillas. <laughs> So there's a lot of chest thumping that happens there for a reason, uh, for, followed with vocals and, and so on. And this again is used uh, territorially uh, to, to uh, symbolize uh, the dominance in a territory or the control of a territory. The picture you see uh, on the right uh, is actually a, a, a large silverback, um, well, successfully did, uh, defending his territory against a rival male that came in. And uh, this does not result, uh, this particular incident, uh, again, taken, uh, a picture taken by Richard, uh, as he said, did not result in, in a fight at all. Uh, it was just a lot of posturing and uh, chest thumping, and that actually was enough to intimidate uh, the other male away from it. So, yeah, it's, it serves, uh, there are a lot of practical uh, purposes for making a lot of noise out there in the natural world. Now, apart from these, you know, sort of practical functions that we've seen, um, now the 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 area of of uh, of sound in nature has actually fascinated, has been fascinating for us humans 
since time immemorial. And there is a new uh, sort of area of study come out called zoo musicology. And I, I came across this while I was researching for this topic, uh, and it was new to me. And uh, it's actually, there are researchers out there studying a wide range of fields, um, which all sort of combine into this generic area of zoo musicology. Uh, they're studying the relationships uh, between animals. Uh, they're looking at how uh, music and science can uh, can intersperse what meanings it has. Do these sounds actually have a practical purpose or is there more sort of philosophical reasons for this as well? Um, and, and there's, you know, there's, uh, there's musicians. There's a musician um, and philosopher, David Rottenberg, who's actually, he plays music with animals and he's actually studying uh, the science or, or studying the effects of it and the science behind it. Uh, we are all familiar with whale song and how it resembles and how musical it, it can be. Uh, there's been com composers uh, have written music pieces around animal sounds. Uh, famous composer Mozart actually uh, had a pet starling who used to mimic his music. Heavy metal bands have, have uh, released music with gray parrots in them uh, and guinea pigs. And, you know, so we've got the whole work uh, works out there. Uh, but, you know, whatever the study may be and whatever the effects may be, I'm interested to find out what comes out of it. It is a fascinating uh, world uh, of animal sounds. Uh, it can be a very uh, pleasing sound as we're all uh, familiar with whale sounds and, and you know, people use that a lot in, in meditation uh, as well. And uh, yeah, end of it all, it, it, is, it is just a new, another dimension to our experience out there in the wild. And, and it was, I, I mean, I like talking about sounds. I'm a bit of an audiophile myself. I enjoy listening uh, to music in the right setup as well. So this, this area is just fascinating for me. And I hope uh, you enjoyed listening to these sounds uh, as well. So uh, I'll, I'll end the, uh, my presentation here. But uh, I'd like to uh, hear from you if you have any questions uh, for me, and I'll, I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, back over to you, Rob. All right. Thank you so much, Conan. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So do both male and female lions and leopards vocalize and are the females higher pitched than the males? Yes, they, they both vocalize and uh, both have a uh, lions have a variety of calls. Um, I am not sure, and I and I think I can safely say that leopards don't have uh, as large a repertoire because it's just the contact calls that they make initially. But there's also uh, a variety in low growls, snarls, other vocalizations as well uh, during the courtship period, and as well as um, outside of courtship as well. There's a variety of calls, uh, much like cats. There's a lot of mewling. Uh, that happens when they're when they're interacting with their cubs. Uh, cubs specifically have calls to for their mothers as well. Mothers have specific calls to get the attention of their cubs as well. So there is a, a, a large repertoire of calls outside of mating also that exists uh, with large cats too. Uh, generally, I think I I don't know um whether there's a gender difference between the frequency of calls but it's usually the nature of the calls um, that can determine the frequency for example lower sounding calls lower frequency calls have actually sh shown to travel larger distances uh, an example is elephants elephants communicate with herds that are spread out and many of them have subsonic frequencies that is not that is out of our audible range and those subsonic sounds can actually travel to about 40 kilometers in radius and other uh, members of the herd are able to to pick that up. So I think it's really function. Uh, I, I could be wrong here, but I think really function will what uh, sort of kind of determine uh, the frequency, uh, the, the level of frequency in the calls. Great. Thank you for that. Now, one of our guests mentioned listening to um, an oyster toadfish making a guttural and kind of a hissing sound. 
what, what do you attribute these sounds to? So it's, it's fascinating that uh, <clears throat> see, we, we don't know exactly what sound means what, uh, I, because it's just now that, you know, that, that's where, you know, the world of science is, is so vast and it's, it's opening up now. And I think as we get more and more, uh, it's actually the availability of information is a lot more now. So, which means there are a lot more people now studying various things. And I'm just interested to see if someone can actually decipher a language of what the codefish makes. But right now, what they've known is that most of these sounds are emitted during courtship. Uh, they, they, they have hissing, that is true. Uh, some species can actually hiss. Some species have a more lower sound. And it's actually not just one particular sound, but it can be a variety, it's usually three or four sounds that can be um, attributed to courtship, uh, sort of a territorial warning or just, you know, a warning or a, a, a call to attention really that happens. I mean, those are the basic main three uh, deductions that, you know, uh, that exist here. Great, thank you for that. Another one of our guests have been reading reports of baby talk among dolphins that they talk to their their children, their offspring, and uh, a different tone. Is is that common? Is that something that is true? Yes, that is true. And it's and uh, and more and more, uh, the more and more we, we learn, we have seen that it's not, I mean, we early thought it was only there in humans. Uh, but now people have studied dolphins enough to know that they are as complex as humans, uh, not just in communication, but also uh, behavior as well. And many animals, <clears throat> Excuse me. Many animals have specific tonal differences uh, when it comes to their own offspring or offspring of the sort of a group or, or, or litter. Wild dogs, for instance, or the painted dogs of Africa have separate tones and there's a lot of yelps and, and little high pitched shrill things when they're playing with the cubs. So while we don't know what exactly that means, we know that it's something specific for the pups and not something for the other adults. So you could only imagine that it could be something very specific. It could actually be baby talk, teaching them something, imparting information down uh, onto these animals. And, and like we saw with the zebra finches, they have baby talk too. I mean, who would have thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? So, uh, so you say the stork makes a knocking sound. How does that happen? It's just, again, um, go to YouTube again. Uh, I, I didn't put videos up for this because otherwise this, this presentation would have been too long and videos sometimes don't often play. But please go to YouTube and look up shoe bill stock. Uh, they actually clack their bills and they sort of walk around parading themselves. Uh, and that, that clacking of bills again is so rapid. It almost sounds like a, like a machine gun uh, firing. And in the middle of all this clacking, they also make these little howling sounds uh, vocally as well. It's it's crazy. You have to see the video uh, to actually believe what's happening there. <laughs> wow. Great. Thank you so much, Conan. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw right. it back to you for closing comments. All right. Uh, before I close, I am actually going to try uh, to see if we can do the bellbird. Uh, again, I have it on my uh, phone and um, all right, so here goes. All right. On that note, uh, I, I mean, I just want to say that, uh, you know, while we all enjoy the uplifting sounds of, you know, songbirds or the soothing sounds of whales, uh, I would just say, you know, the next time you're out there in nature, let's try and stop and, and listen and try and understand what sort of goes behind the sound. And that's for me personally, I can I can attest that it's been uh, such a, you know, enlightening way to kind of discover nature. Uh, that's around you and sometimes you just sit there with your eyes closed and you have this whole world uh, unfold in front of you. So try that the next time you're out there. 
uh, and that's an exercise I would highly, highly recommend. Uh, but on today, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, do sign in for our other shows as well. I'm going to be talking to you a lot of the, uh, the science behind some of these things that we see out there in nature. Uh, so sign up for future talks. And uh, thank you for, for uh, supporting us and joining these talks uh, every day. Uh, it's, it's great fun to talk to you. And I hope you have uh, fun listening to all of us as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a lovely week uh, ahead. Thank you, Conan, so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you could travel with NADHAP, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you could send us an email at info at nathap.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.